Good to be here with you. I'm a little bit, I'm struggling right now because I smell what you smell. <laughs> and it's hard enough. I'll go close the door. Well, it's just, it's just it's the, cat, the cat dung got out of the bag. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the problem with that is, you know, you can play that off pretty good if you have, if it's like, hey, thanks for, thanks for your attention. Yeah, we'll be done shortly, and then we can all enjoy that nice food. But it's, it's actually a couple hours off yet. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, so it's good to, good to be here with you. Thank you so much for, uh, for, for, uh, for having me. And um, I'll uh, do some introduction, but let, um, let me pray first. God, thank you for, for Deschler. Memories here uh, of this building when it was brand new and people here and uh, um, your work. And I thank you for your consistent, steadfast love and care for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, okay, so how many of you have I met before? I'm, I'm like, most of you probably, I was younger, had more hair, I think. Okay, Willis hasn't aged. Um, yeah, Kevin is just not what he used to be. But, you know, Willis, you're looking pretty good still. So, um, and then, anyway, so, okay, so I was here. First time I was here, it was 19, uh, well, no, it was uh, 90, 96 choir tour. We did Fairbury, and there was Blizzard. Remember the Blizzard? Okay, we were in Fairbury, and uh, Rick Larson was there, and they put us up in a hotel because there weren't enough host families, so we went to the hotel, and, uh, well, the hotel, it wasn't much of a hotel. I don't know if it's still there or not, but, and, uh, and Walmart was across the street, and it was a legitimate blizzard, enough that, you know, it, it was trouble for the bus. So remember that. Then a few years later, 1999, I was here, and the, the cornerstone out there says August 15th. And I know I was here for a concert in late July, early August. I have a vivid memory of something that happened that I won't go into. But, um, but, but my, yeah, I got to tell you. All right. So <laughs> one of our team members who shall remain nameless because this is recorded passed out. And I was sitting back here with his feet up on a chair, laying on the ground. And the, but the visual I have was he, I was singing his part. I was tra traveling with him as a chaperone, and I was, but I was singing his part just to stand in because that's what heroes do, right? Not all heroes wear capes. Some sing tenor. So the, uh, so I was, but, but all I could see was his feet up on a chair, and Jerry Nickenen bent over him with a dish towel like this, <laughs> and that's, and if you ever see that while you're singing, while you're singing sacred, you know, solemn contemplative movie. <laughs> And Jerry, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking if I saw this when I came to, I'd just go back out. So, <laughs> so, so that was, that's my memory. And I can't, so, so it must have been before the grand opening, before the cornerstone date. So anyway, and I know your, your congregation has been very supportive of the school as well. Thankful for that. Uh, the place has been there almost 60 years now. And uh, I've, been, I've been there six as, uh, as president and uh, was a pastor for 12 years before that, church planting in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Living Word Free Lutheran Church. Loved it. Just loved it. It was, a, it was fantastic. And uh, God called to the school, and that's, that's been good, too. It's been a lot of hard work. I'm very thankful for where we are. And more than anything, um, we've survived this year. Like, everybody's tried to survive a little bit, and uh, we've survived this year. Uh, we have 96 students. I think we would have had probably... You know, 110 or so without COVID, but and it's not just COVID; it's just it's everything. So you get a phone call from a parent in Western North Dakota, in you know, like August 15th, saying, "Well, my two kids are coming to Bible college. I'm just not sure if I'm comfortable with it right now." And you know, afraid, of, little afraid of COVID, a lot afraid of what our governor is going to do next. And that's the, never mind. And then. But then also, I don't know if you saw the news, but Minneapolis, it wasn't a great year for PR for Minneapolis last year. You, oh, you've heard about that. Okay, great. Um, and so it used to be, um, and so there's this balance where you don't want your students or my kids, you know, just, I don't want them growing up afraid of the mission field, afraid of people, afraid of soul, you know, three million precious eternal human souls for whom Christ died right there in Minneapolis, St. Paul metropolitan area. We can't be afraid of that. And most of, most of them are lost and scared just like we are. They, they, you know, they don't, you know, the people who had their houses and businesses burned, they did not burn their houses and businesses. <laughs> and so if you, think it's, if, if you think it's bad that there's places where you can't go safely, well, imagine living there. 
and what, and what hope do you have? And they're stuck. They can't move out. And the, in my mind, that's, that's way worse than me sitting in Plymouth thinking, oh, oh Lord, it's just so, so close to us. You know, it just, what about them? What about them? And so uh, I, think we, there, I think there's an opportunity here in this societal unrest, which is just fruit. It's just fruit of a bitter root. That's what it is. There's opportunity here uh, for us to reach these souls and for God to reach our hearts with a love for souls, a little less defensiveness, a little less tribalism. And, uh, and so I, I really think it's a great time to be a Christian. I think it's a great time to be in the business of establishing students in the eternal and inerrant word of God. Um, there are challenges that go along with it, but increasingly our challenges are external, and that's where they should be. Um, it's very frustrating to me to talk to parents, and this, is, this was happening when I was a Bible school student. You know, I was saved when I was 18. Uh, I, was, I'm, I was converted to Christ in Lutheran church, and my generically baptist it's like Billy Graham Craig Quakerism, honestly, is what I was raised in. They didn't know what to do with that. How can you get converted in a Lutheran church? And um, so it was, uh, that, that was my background. My mom heard about the Bible school and thought it would be a good place to go. I had already had plans. I went to SDSU, engineering physics and physical education. That's another story. And um, the, uh, the parents then wanted students to go. But something changed in there. When I started working at the school, the, par- the conversations I would have would be with, with parents of children who wanted to go, but the parents didn't want them to go. And that's continued now. And that's many, many parents. So the grandparents want them to go. <laughs> the parents don't want them to go. The kids want to go. <laughs> and so how do you navigate this? And when you ask why, here's the why. I want my, I want my, I want my kids to get on with their lives. They've got to go make money. And, I, and they don't want to take two years. But, but, but I know what you know, and that is nobody finishes in four years anymore. You change majors once, and you, got, you, know, you change your mind once, and you've got six years on your hands. Um, and some of these students who go off to XYZ State University do pretty well with Christ. But the vast majority of them just get blown away. And then parents modify their theology to put their kids in heaven. <laughs> and so it's this lose, lose, lose cycle. And, um, and that, in this past year, I've had better conversations with people. Because right now, we're all... I think our whole culture has this moment, and I don't think it's going to last much longer, where we are asking ultimate, substantial, foundational questions. And it's not going to take too long to get the economy back going and get out and about, find more recreational things to do to lose our, to lose our, our opportunity with it. Uh, but right now, there's a whole bunch of people asking a whole bunch of questions, and that gives you good opportunity. So I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. So, All right. Um, I have a wife and two children. Uh, wife Michelle is fantastic. I, uh, I have pictures of them, but not in this stock slideshow. Because this stock slideshow, if my children are there, they just go nuts. When they see their picture on the screen, it's just they've reached that age where they do this. They do, they do. It's like, oh, no, I can't believe it. <laughs> it's like, Ben, he pointed us out. They're all looking at us. Oh, it's a drama. So anyway, Hannah's 11 and adopted. And we were eight and a half. See, see, we were, see, we, Ben is eight and a half months younger and biological. So we were two weeks pregnant with Ben when Hannah was born. And I still don't know where babies come from. We got the only two kids we got. Uh, the stork is the leader in the clubhouse. But, um, but anyway, it's one of those things where, you know, we, nine years, no kids. And then we adopt Hannah. And we were pre- I just, anyway, I, I have no idea. Okay, so they're great. They're best friends. We have a lot of fun doing ministry together. I can't wait to see them tonight. So, all right, uh, start here, grow, uh, go anywhere grounded in God's word. And that's, that's, that's the idea. Now, this past, uh, past year, our, um, our recruiting team has started to try to figure out how to talk better about what does it look like to, uh, what does it look like to, to, to start here? What do, we, what do we look at when we're on campus? And uh, th- they put it this way, scripture without distraction, discipleship without distance, 
and ministry within the congregation. So, what, you know, what study the Bible is what we do. Two thirds of our classes are exegetical, so verse by verse, taking truth out of Scripture. The other third are applying that in various aspects of systematic theology, you know, that's doctrine by doctrine, and application of what, what does this look like in your life and in the congregation and in your family and in the world. So, uh, but 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 what does that look like? Well, um, it's a lot of focus on Scripture in a way that isn't reasonable to do the rest of your life. You, you probably aren't going to spend three hours a day studying scripture for the rest of your life. As much as, much as you know, that sounds like a lot of fun to me. And it's one of the things I enjoyed about being a pastor was if you averaged it all out, I probably spent two hours a day. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, and somebody paid me for it. I remember the first paycheck I got as a pastor. I'm thinking, they pay me for this? This is great. And then the honeymoon wore off. I remember, they don't pay me enough for this. <laughs> so, but, uh, so the... Uh, but, but, but we've got this um, focused, non-distracted study of Scripture. A- and then also discipleship without distance. I, I'm, thankfully, almost nobody asks me about when are you going to go online with the Bible school. Uh, I think we've had, uh, in, uh, in proverbial terms, we've smoked the whole pack on distance education this year, and we don't, we don't want it anymore. Um, there are still a handful of people who will ask me about that for our seminary program. And uh, you know, there are places where you can actually get a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in five years and never leave home. So you too, <laughs> per our conversation last night, <laughs> you too could have a 23-year-old pastor who knows everything <laughs> and has never left his mother's basement. So you know, I just don't understand how you can iron sharpens iron you know, when the plow doesn't get close enough to the wheel to make any sparks. So... The, the on-campus atmosphere we have where you are forced to deal with stuff. I'm not saying it's sin to train a pastor remotely. And if we were starting a seminary from scratch, we might have to figure out something because bricks and mortar are very, very expensive unless you do it yourself. So um, even if you do it yourself anymore. Uh, but we've got this, this on-campus environment where, where we can start with a, maybe a, a questionable seminary candidate like John Langness and work with him <laughs> for three years honing and shaping and and then i'll go off on internship for a little bit more and uh we're very much committed to that and at the same time uh, we yeah i realize there are people who would like some training who who can't move for whatever reason but if they can't move for that reason they're also not going to be able to move to go be a pastor of a church and maybe maybe that's a different kind of a program maybe that's something we could look into uh, but for our pastoral training we think that's best done uh, in person and contagiously and then also um, ministry within the congregation Th- this is one of those things that you say over and over and over again and you wonder if people are catching on to it where uh, you know, the, the bible college is not a congregation there's a sense of community there that people love you know fellowship if you will okay but it is not a congregation the ministries at 3110 East Medicine Lake Boulevard, including ours, we are not what it's about. What it's about is a local congregation. And when you're trying to lead an organization, one of the questions you have to answer again and again and again is who is it that we're trying to serve? I mean, that's true if you're a farmer or in the restaurant business or, or, or running a Bible college. Who are we serving? You know, and the, the, of course, the, the correct answer is we're serving Jesus. Well, yeah, okay, well, everybody is, but what about in your, okay, so we're serving our students, is what we're doing. So we don't serve ourselves, we're not there for self-preservation of the Bible school, uh, Bible college. See, I'm the worst. <laughs> Freely, we got the name change thing going on, I am the worst. And then people are all embarrassed when they get it wrong around me, and how many times have I said it wrong to you? So, all right, so th- you know, we're not there for preservation of the Free Lutheran Bible College and Seminary. We're there to establish students in God's eternal and inerrant word. And, and that's, that has an outcome in the local congregation. So we're serving the congregation indirectly by training the students directly, and we're not there for the college and seminary. It's a different viewpoint. I, I'm pretty sure where I went to college, South Dakota State University, I'm pretty sure that preservation of the institution is a very big deal, or especially if it's you know, XYZ, whatever private school, right? If you don't go to Harvard, you don't go to Harvard to be, you know, to be taught to be a servant of all, right? I know this isn't a question to ask. No, go for it. No, no, that's fine. I don't want to lose my train of thought. 
Don't, that's all right. Uh, so we're training students in the in Bible college. Mm -hmm. um, we see a large majority of not returning to AFLC congregations. Mm -hmm. What are you or the, the... Yeah, that's a great question. The teachers doing to address that? That's a great question. Why are they not? Yeah. Okay, so first of all, um, our alumni surveys show that... Uh, 90% of our students, when they graduate uh, in the past five years, are involved in a congregation of some kind, right. which is pretty good. Right. Two-thirds of those are in AFLC congregations. Okay. So the narrative isn't quite... Okay. okay. Now, now what, I'd like that to be 100% and 100%. Sure, sure. Um, and so you, you talk about some of, it's, some of it's location, you know, if you're in a place without a free Lutheran church, but... But some of it is, is simply preference. Um, and, and there's a lot of reasons for it. And there's different reasons for it. Okay, so for instance, um, some of them... You can't make them go to Well, we also have people who'd like us to. Yeah, I know. And that's a mistake, too. Yeah, yeah nothing... Yeah, and, or brand loyalty. You know, you really ought to. Yeah, that doesn't really... Um, anyway, I mean, brand loyalty died in the, in the 70s. I mean, you know, there are people... There are people in this immediate vicinity who would actually put a valley pivot on their property. <laughs> I, I don't understand. But um, anyway, there's a, uh, but so I'm trying to avoid that. Okay, but, but, here, but here's the catch. There's a lot of our students who aren't Lutheran. And so okay. if to come in, I'd say two thirds of our students, and I'm not sure about that, about two thirds of our students are from AFLC congregations. Okay, but not all of them were really Lutheran either, because I wasn't. I mean, I was unbaptized. I was, <laughs> when I came, I, I, nobody even asked me about baptism. I didn't even know. I mean, I knew nothing. In, uh, in doctrine class with Pastor Lee, I said out loud, okay, this is Pastor Lee. Some of you know Pastor Lee. Imagine Pastor Lee hearing this from a 23-year-old -year recovering basketball coach when I raised my hand in class, in doctrine class, and I said, you guys actually believe this stuff? No. I said that first first quarter, and he looked at me like, <laughs> and, and I, yeah. So, so this is now obviously it, it stuck for me, <laughs> but there's a bunch of them who just they're just not Lutheran, and and so going to a free Lutheran church, they don't really care about that. Now, I would like to think that we have more Lutherans coming in or going out than coming in because we teach a Lutheran program. And we, our program is Lutheran enough doctrinally that some of the students who aren't Lutheran sometimes complain about, you know, being too Lutheran. And then, yeah, anyway. So why? I think, I think, it's, I think, it's, uh, I think there's a couple things. First, the students aren't all that committed to it as a whole. And we're trying to change that by the content, that this is important. It's not heritage. You're not doing this for Ludafisk and Lefsa or to make grandma happy. You're doing this because this is actually true. Now, I'm in a good spot to talk about that because that's the only reason I'm there. I've got, I've got, no, I've got no connections to anything other than this, this is the doctrine by which God saved me. So I'm committed to that. Okay, but the second thing is our congregations, too. Because when I was at Living Word in Sioux Falls, our, uh, we didn't have graduates move to Sioux Falls and not go to our church. Some of them went to Abiding Savior, you know, the other Free Lutheran church in town. And, uh, but when they came to Living Word, we grabbed them and put them to work. And if, if, if a congregation does not actively receive discover the gifts of the student, what God has made them to be, and how to involve them in the congregation. Not with busy work, but you realize when a new member joins your church, your congregation changes forever. By definition, because we're the aggregate. So if the student comes and wants to go to church and doesn't get, doesn't get grabbed and involved, and they just get turned into a spectator or a number, well, they're going to go someplace cooler and easier to be a spectator and a number. And that's what we have in our churches that are smaller. We have the opportunity to be much more intimate, much more engaging, much more inclusive than you can at a megachurch. But if we, if we don't engage them, 
then they're going to find someplace else to be unengaged. So I think some of it's our students. I think some of it is our congregations. And uh, the only thing I can control is what we do as faculty and staff. So we want to teach the doctrine well. Uh, we want to help them engage in a Free Lutheran congregation while they are with us. And I do have a slide on that in a second because we're, we're doing some stuff to try to help. Uh, I don't think lecturing the congregations is going to help. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's going to hurt. And I don't think lecturing the students is going to help. But uh, I mean, that's a concern that I have because I'm like a, is it, I'm, a, I'm an is it true guy. I, and anyway, so that, did that help at all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and I, I also don't want to, I also don't want to make a kid feel totally guilty but I won't feel a little guilty. <laughs> so there's kind of a balance there. And, okay, all right. Um, yeah, but the congregation is where it's at. And I want to make sure our students understand that. So there's a picture. Uh, I'm not sure what you can see there. Um, do you see the city? This little, little bar graph in the background. Okay, that's Minneapolis. And uh, we used to highlight our proximity to the city. But last year we started saying, yeah, so it's only, fif it's only 15 minutes. It's a 45-minute bike ride to Target Field. Okay, but last year we were thinking, you know, it's, it's, you know we're seven miles away from Minneapolis. You, know, or it's just, you, see, you can barely see the smoke from here. And that's sad. I shouldn't even joke about it. But, I mean, honestly, literally, we could see south of the, south of the skyline. We could see smoke coming up out of south Minneapolis. It's just it's heartbreaking because I, I like going down there. I like, and there are places in Minneapolis right now where I, don't, I can't go. And that was not the case. Well, maybe it was. In the 70s, it was for sure. But anyway. Okay. Uh, that's an overview. You can see the red building behind. That's the Student Life Center. And uh, that's, that, that was under construction. We do still have a tiny bit of snow on the ground, but not a lot. Uh, there's, a, there's a drone shot overhead. The driveway, the students call that the peanut. And there is room. Um, this is distorted. This is actually fairly similar in size. It's kind of figure eight. There's actually room back here for two dormitories if we grow. And, um, and that's all designed. So it'll be, you know, it'll, anyway, the campus is starting to come together nicely. And this, this area has become the favorite hangout for the students. And it's, it's all mud. So I can't wait for it to be grassy. By annual conference, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that we'll have, have some grass. Okay. Uh, this is uh, a couple weeks old, um, and you can't see the color here, but there's artificial turf in this retaining wall uh, so it can drain better, and no railings except for where there's a big drop-off, and that, that's actually legal. So when you come out of it, the, you, know, you just sit down on a concrete wall and visit, and it's south-facing, so you can get a sunburn in March. Uh, that's, that's at night. It's uh, well lit all around, and all those lights point down. You know how city codes are. We can't possibly have a yard light uh, impact somebody's yard. So it, it's, it's safe to, it's good for our neighbors, but it's also, it lights up the campus, which is, is a safety help too. This is probably my favorite picture. This is our opening game. <laughs> And uh, one side of the gym has bleachers, the other side does not. So the, the photographer had his back to the, the benches, the, the wall where the benches are. And uh, the, the bleachers seat 480. They have backs. And all of this is open up to the, uh, the, the commons area. So for annual conference this year, th what's going to happen is everybody's going to go up, have their coffee, stand around and talk. And poor Lyndon's going to be sitting down on the floor doing his, you know, <laughs> I think what he should do, because he's subtle, he's not subtle. It doesn't, you know, we all know what he's thinking. So I, I think he should just start weeping. I think that would be the best <laughs> approach, I think, sometimes. Because, you, know, you, know, you know, gentle suggestions certainly isn't working. Um, you know, mild annoyance, that's not working. I think this year he should just start weeping, and then people will come back in. So. Big error. Yeah, big, yeah, big error. Or John Benson, right? <laughs> yeah, John Benson, there it is. Uh, the fireplace, uh, some soft seating around it. I uh, would like to reserve that spot for me, but I don't think that's going to happen. Large classroom space. So this, you can't really get a perspective on this, but inside there, there's, there's the divided classroom. So there's a, there's a wall. Those two classrooms together are much bigger than any space we have on our campus educationally. If you divide them in two, they're slightly smaller than our big classrooms in Heritage Hall right now. 
We don't absolutely need this space for additional students, but the way construction works in the city, if you don't build it now, you don't get to build it then. So we built every square foot they would allow us to build, we built, because you can't, if you leave 5,000 square feet on the table, you can't go back and do it. I mean, you can add on, but it's so expensive to add on 5,000 square feet. We decided to do this. At annual conference, um, like the AED booth will be in there. So um, not the whole thing, you know, but all the ministry displays will be, will be in there. And that's probably where we'll have our Summer Institute of Theology. We'll have good technology set up where we can live stream classes and things like that. That's a picture of the commons area. The front of the, it's full court press, coffee and concessions. Uh, the front of this will be a, kind of a metallic look. There is something that's been on back order for six months. I don't know how you can have something on back order for, for six months because you can design something and bring it to, you can, you know, you can make a, a vaccine in six months these days, but they can't give us, you know, <laughs> anyway, so that's on back order. But the uh, coffee shop during the week that'll be open, you know, some, not, not, all, not a lot because it's not a money maker. It's a, it's a student service. But for games, and there's going to be a lot of games in here. Uh, our games, um, local homeschool basketball league, there's a couple teams that are going to use it as a home court. Uh, we've already had a couple colleges ask us to use it as a neutral site, meet in Minneapolis and play. So we're going to have a lot of games in there. So there's going to be a lot of popcorn smell, I have a feeling. And this, uh, this front seating area is all open to the south side. So you can't get a sunburn in January, but you'll be able to get some vitamin D a little bit anyway. There's more of the seating. And there's the front of that uh, concession and coffee stand. So we, we have equipment in there now. So espresso machine, popcorn, and some, some light quick serve food as well. Four locker rooms look something like that. And uh, four locker rooms, some men's and women's, home and away. But more importantly, our students could change in the dorm easily. But more importantly, if you're going to have a, a tournament or a Saturday jamboree kind of thing, just run them through. And one of the things we'd like to do is um, ministry. In fact, we're, we're expanding it this year. Uh, Brad Byerly, who is director of student life and also athletic director of men's basketball coach, we're splitting up that position. And he's going to be director of athletic ministry. So... He'll still be doing basketball coach and athletic director, but we're also expanding it to, to figure out how we can best use this facility to minister not just to our students, but also through our students. In suburbia, youth basketball leagues are, um, it's kind of cliche. It, it's, a, it's a money thing and a prestige thing. But if you go, if you go in towards the city, it's a rescue device. And I, I think we, you know, my kids played in a basketball league where, you know, about a quarter of the kids were white. You know, my kids are very white. So um, I liked it. But the league had to shut down because it didn't have a place to play. It kills me. And so it's been two years, it's dead. It's, it's gone. But, you know, I've got some friends who used to work with that league. And it, you know, these are kids, these are, I mean, these kids are problems. And their parents are problems. <laughs> and you can get them. It, you can get their kids in your basketball league, teach them skills and drills and Jesus. And they don't, they don't care. They don't care. It's not, like they're, it's not like they're against Jesus. It's they just want some stability. And you can provide that for a kid. And, uh, you know, I've, I've coached a lot of basketball in my life, uh, but probably the most influential stuff was this time spent with these little kids who had, no, had nothing. And uh, I, I loved my kids being a part of that where – they were interacting with the mission field, but it was a secure environment. It, it's not like they were going up against a, a secular humanist with a master's degree in a kindergarten. You know, it wasn't that. It was, it was, we had the environment, but they were surrounded by, by kids who were different from them and Christian and non-Christian too. So, and and I, I love the fact that color of skin isn't a thing for my kids because it, it's, a more, it's a more diverse population than what I grew up with. And so you don't have to wonder if the person with black skin is a Christian or not. You know, it's just not even a question for them. It's, is this person a Christian or not? Because I don't know, you guys probably have some people in Deschler who aren't saved, right? Okay, all right. So, um, uh, conquerors, there we are. Um, proudly made with Dactronics. And, uh, you know, I was an electrical engineering student, engineering physics actually, at SDSU, where Dactronics started. And would you believe that gives you no discount on their products? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so uh, 
yeah, nice, nice nice square board. I I put this up here because I kind of like that's cool. That that's really nice. I and I anyway, I had nothing to do with it. That's really cool. So yeah, there's the there's the the yeah. Oh, here's my kids, Hannah and Ben. But you can barely see them. So they're they're lots of fun. She's a crafter. She can do. Okay, remember nature nurture that whole thing. I'm not I'm not a crafter. My wife is not a crafter. My daughter taught herself how to knit and crochet and sew, and she she just she does stuff and just like like one time on the way to church and we only live 20 minutes away she crocheted like a a hat or something for a friend like a a make what are you doing hannah oh i'm making a gift for this friend and say like, yeah but we're almost there and she's well i'm almost done I said, okay how do you i just i don't i do not understand okay ben is into building he likes all things sports and he was as obsessed with this building as i was so um and there's a picture from the back of the bleachers. Oh, so at annual conference, the, uh, the platform will be right here. And all the PA and the lighting, it's all built in. So we're not going to have to rent stuff. We are going to have to rent projectors. We decided not to include those because you're not going to use a projector in here that much. And projectors are so expensive and they get out of date really fast. This one has endured. So, uh, but this is like, this would be like putting $10,000 of projector up in your ceiling and using them twice a year. It just doesn't make sense. So we'll have to rent that, but everything else is plug and play, and it's going to be so easy to have conference there. Having said that, it'll be a disaster. So um, 480 seats in the bleachers, but the bleachers have backs, which tell you more about the average age of the building committee than anything else. And then the floor, we can see the total of 1,000 between the bleachers and the floor, plus the overflow up top. So it'll be a very comfortable place to have annual conference. And yes, we will be covering the floor uh, before we walk on it. We're a little... Uh, little persnickety about that so all right there's so much there's, there's so much there's a lot going on and this is just a a, a sampling of it uh, I, I mentioned director of athletic ministry we're gonna we're looking to see how we can use this facility not just to stay busy and not not to make money although keeping it full will help um, but how to reach souls for Christ and to teach our students how to use athletics which is an idol for many and, and was for me um, how to use that as a, as, a, as a means of ministry for souls. Uh, we have a pilot program starting next year, depending on if, if anybody bites on it. The beauty of a pilot program is that you don't have to, you don't have to do it. So if, if nobody's interested, I'm not selling them on it, it doesn't have to happen. If nobody does it, then we, then we won't do it. But I think we'll, we'll have a handful. Look for five or six students uh, to, to pilot a, uh, a third year program uh, the, that's the reason. It's, we figure if we can keep them in an AFLC congregation longer, they're more likely to stick. Because I do think you, if you come to Minneapolis, you're 18 years old, the first thought in your mind is not, what congregation can I engage with and plug in and become a mature, functioning, participatory member? I mean, you, it's not what you're thinking. So I think sometimes our expectation, it's not, it's not, my expectation isn't quite accurate, but the eventual expectation is. So then you got to think, what age or stage of life appropriate um, interactions should we be encouraging to help them get there? Because the first year, you're just kind of figuring it all out. And by the time you find a, a, a church home, you got gospel teams and basketball teams and all that fired up. You're gone every other weekend. It's very hard to get involved. Second year, you might plug in, but then you leave. So we're trying to get them involved a little quicker with, a, with an AFLC congregation. And it's not like we're twisting their arms or anything, but especially if they're from an AFLC church, we really want to hook them up with an AFLC congregation. And we're trying to keep them engaged a little more intentionally and a little longer, and I think that'll help. And so the Advanced Congregational Training Pilot Program, it's a, it's a third year we have room on campus right now, so it's a good time to try it. And we're coming out of COVID, so it's a kind of a weird time. And our students have had a couple weird years. This is a chance for them to have maybe a normal year. So we're going to try it and see what happens with it. Uh, it's, um, it's 12 credits, three credits each semester, and 12 credits per semester. Three credits each semester is a uh, servant leadership in the congregation class that I'm teaching. So all the congregational training kind of stuff that I did at Living Word, and some congregational theology, so that, that everybody will take that. Um, another, another class is um, a three-credit formal internship in an AFLC congregation. 
So we've already found a handful of places where the congregation could use some help and it's a, it's a mature-ish congregation with a mature-ish pastor and a functional-ish. Because we're not healthy. None of us are healthy, right? We're all a mess. But try to find some place where it's not a, a dumpster fire where this student can learn in some area of ministry and participate. So that's, that's another three credits. And then the other three credits, you can take electives you haven't taken yet at the Bible college. You can take one seminary class if, you're try, if people are trying to get a taste of that. And you can also take... Um, you, you, well, you have to take one, and you may take two emphases, and the emphases are uh, Bible teaching, so how to teach the Bible. We teach a lot of the Bible in Bible college, but we don't teach a lot of what's called pedagogy, so how to teach the Bible effectively. Uh, so their, 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 their son-in-law is, uh, is a really good teacher. It's not just knowledge, but it's how to instruct, and so we're going to try to teach that as well. Uh, Sports ministry, youth and family ministry, uh, Jason Holt's a big part of that, and we already, we already do that, but this is going to be an advanced version of that. And then worship leading. We regularly in the AFLC, uh, AFLC lose people who are interested in worship leading because there's no, there's no place to do it. There's no, um, there's, there's no vocational place to do it and get paid, but there's a lot of times there's no, you know, you know, I play guitar. Can I play guitar here? And if the answer is no, well, and I'm not saying you've got to have a guitar to be a good church, but if you've got, you know, we, we weren't a big organ crowd at Living Word, but we had four organists. So you know what you do? You buy an organ. That's equipping the saints for the work of service. And if you don't have four organists, you don't sit around whining about not having any organists. So you got to go with what you got and uh, dance with them that brung you. So, okay. Um, Congregational Connections Coordinator. Some of you know Pastor Wayne Germstad. Pastor Wayne Germstad is a 73-year-old who does not look 73. Uh, he's a uh, retired-ish pastor. He'll never retire. He's our interim pastor at my, home, er, my current congregation, Solid Rock Free Lutheran in Anoka. And he is a force of nature in connecting students with our congregation. So our congregation of Solid Rock, you know, we have, unless they're out on, on teams or something, we have 20 of our 96 students attending church at Solid Rock. Many of them are engaged somehow in the ministry, and it's because Wayne Germstead connects with them. And Wayne Germstead, if you've never, he talks like this, and he talks very close. Yes, he does. <laughs> social distance. The first thing I thought of when they talked about social distancing was how will Wayne Germstead function? Yes. So anyway, um, but he's delightful, and he can get away with it. So, so what, so what we're, we're actually, uh, he's going to start June 1st, very part-time. It's a retirement job, uh, working with our students on campus and the congregations in our district to try to build bridges. And he's, if I go in, and it's going to come off as, you know, you know, you pastors and congregations, you got to do more to connect. You know, that's, that's not going to work. And, um, and, you know, it's not like they're not doing anything. They got stuff to do, right? So we're going to try to bridge that. And I'm also not going to lecture our students. So what we can do is uh, Wayne can go try to build bridges. And so I think, think that that'll help. Annual conference, June 12th to 15th. Love to have you. And Summer Institute of Theology, uh, August 2nd through 6th. It's two half weeks this time. First half week is a guy named, what's that? Annual conference is 16th to the 19th. Um, Is that right? I think it's wrong up there. That's wrong. That's wrong? Yeah. That's not good. <laughs> but if you're going to host us up there anyway. Gonna... <laughs> you're sure, aren't you? Yeah. Okay. It's Father's Day weekend. Yeah. Like Wednesday through the Saturday. You punks. <laughs> How dare you? I got weight on the hook. <laughs> yeah. Just a second here. 12th through the 15th, that's not even a, that's not even the right part of the week. No. This second, seriously, Deschler people. All right. Okay, 16th through 19th. There, you happy now? Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. I live to serve. Boy, I wasn't even close. Anyway, okay. Okay. Um, Brian Chappell uh, is kind of a big deal. He wrote the, one of our textbooks for preaching called Christ-Centered Preaching. He'll be there for the first half of the week. Second half of the week, there's three guys. 
Um, one is Zach Hicks, who wrote one of our textbooks for worship ministry. He's fantastic. And uh, then also Gary Jorgensen, uh, who is the uh, assistant to the president of the AFLC. He wrote a study on First and Second Peter, forthcoming from parish education. And uh, it's a great study. So I, I, he's been teaching it at our church. It's fantastic. So I asked him to teach it there. And then also Nathan Olson will be uh, teaching on virtue ethics. So does he talk about that stuff in the shop? In the shop? Yeah. No. You don't let him get going on that, do you? <laughs> Keep him farming focused when he's here. It's good for him. So all right. That's right. That's right. And, it's, and, and when Andrew's here, he probably tries to invent stuff to help yeah. you rate. Yeah, okay. I know the kind. I know the type. So anyway, so there's a, there's a, lot, a lot going on. I know it's a long drive because I'm about to do it. And, uh, <laughs> but if you ever find yourself up in that direction on your way to catch some fish or something, love to show you around anytime. It's a good place. We have room to grow. And business-wise, if, if at 130 students, you know, we, we don't really have a huge need for strategic giving. That said, we'll cash the checks. But at 130 students, it's the whole thing is designed to work at 130 students without having to beg for millions of dollars. Okay. So really, we need students. And I think we can get there. I, I refuse to believe. So 130 students, that would be 75 students every year. And then you lose a few between year one and year two. But I refuse to believe that there aren't 75 students in this world who need what we have. So we're going to find them. And we're going we're to get the place full. So all right. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a number in my head, but, but very few. Getting better, getting, getting better. But for um, when we did it, when I got there six years ago, we, we put pins in the map, you know, of where everybody was. There's actually programs that'll do that for you. That's very nice. But pins are more satisfying. Okay, um, the geographical center of our student body when I got there was approximately Fargo, and I'm not joking. If, but if you think about it, kind of makes sense. So Pastor Lee, so I asked Pastor Lee, why? Why is this, our, the, the Minneapolis district has always been weak in the AFLC. Always. Well, why? And he said, well, well think about the merger. How do you think the city churches voted for the, on the merger? They all went in. And so really the geographical center of the AFLC was Fargo <laughs> or Valley City or something like that. So really it's just, let's start a Bible college in it was outside of our geographic area after the merger. You know, LFC, it would have been perfect. But after the merger, that's a, so what we're trying to do now is you, know, you should be able to win on your home court. You should be able to get students to come to you. From, and we're only at $13,000 tuition, room, board, and fees. And we can't find, we found one two-year college in Moorhead, state college, that charges less than we do. And yet I do hear on occasion how expensive it is. Well, going to college is more expensive than not going to college. That is most certainly true. But as colleges go, I mean, it's just, I mean, adjusted for inflation, it's, yeah. While you're on that subject, I got you. Yeah. how many congregations support their, their kids to go to, to the Bible college and the seminary? I'd say about a third. About um, a third, third directly, which contribute, sounds, contribute. contribute. Now, that sounds low, but it's actually pretty good. That's it, something we need to encourage the congregations to do. Yeah, and so just a little bit. So, for instance, $13,000, but you're not going to get federal financial aid. And that's okay because half of that you got to pay back anyway, and you got to let the nose of the camel into your tent to get that. And I'm, I'm not feeling that. So, um, but, you know, given like, I know churches who do full tuition, which is a lot. But, I mean, $1,000 a year would take the edge off a lot. If you come in with your first semester paid, you can work your way through and get out, out of debt. Which I think is a good thing for a student to take ownership of. Oh, yeah, I agree. But I'm not so much worried about the financial side of things. I'm more worried about the pastors talking to the 5-year-old on up to the 14-year-old kids, encouraging them to attend the Bible yep. College, and for the young boys to consider a ministry. Yep. Uh, back in their age, uh, when they were growing up, it was talked about all the time about young men going into the ministry. I don't know that that's being talked about. Well, it's a it's a harder it's a harder sales job right now. Uh, yeah. You got to focus on call. Right. 
because it's hard because you're, you know, you're the bad guy. A, a biblically faithful pastor today is the enemy. And it's not going to get any better for a long time. But, but in, my, in my life, in my mind, who cares? I mean, if it's, if it's worth doing, I mean, we used, to, we used to actually go die for stuff. <laughs> so, you know, that it's, the, but the, the cushy thing, and, and fr- frankly, I think the generation that we're recruiting right now as Bible college students, they want a challenge. I think they're open to it. Uh, and right now in the seminary, it, all this is the pipeline enterprise. Bible college attendance comes from effective, fruitful ministry in the congregation. Because if, if, if the congregation isn't that big a deal to you, and Jesus isn't such a big deal to you, you're not going to go there. Okay. So it comes from that. Our seminarians generally come from Bible college contact. And then they go back. The, the Bible college students trained as lay leaders. The pastors trained as good pastors go back into congregations and that healthy ministry now becomes perpetuating. The problem is, once, you, once the engine stops and you get stuck top dead center, you gotta spin it somehow. And it's gonna take a while to get that going. And that's where we are right now. I just got a call from James Molstry yesterday. He said, boss, and he, said, he always calls me boss when he wants me to, to listen. He said, boss, I think this is working. Yeah, they had, uh, they, had, they had 30 students come to like a seminary information night, which we've retitled Seminary Scoop in our seminary slice because they have pie and ice cream. And we used to call a semin- seminary information night, which would be abbreviated sin. sin. So we can't have that. <laughs> so, so seminary scoop now. And so we had 30 of them. And some of them, they're just for the pie. But you know what? I can speak positively of that. That's all right. Um, <laughs> but there are a lot of them who are really, inter- you know, seven or eight guys really interested in seminary. So uh, it's starting to work, but it's a pipeline enterprise. And if you rush the root, the, the fruit, if you r- rush the root to get the fruit, then you end up with neither eventually. And so we've had to just take a step back from everything else and focus on what do we do and how do we do it better? Because if you're recruiting Bible college students to a program that you're not convinced is what it needs to be, it's just going to keep getting worse. It's like inviting kids to youth group, and then it's terrible. You hope nobody shows up. So we've never been terrible. But we did have a culture where going to class and doing your homework was optional. And that's not good. And it's not there anymore. And don't tell them that because none of them know it anymore. Because now it's just what we do. They go to class. Taking attendance is so easy because nobody's gone. And they don't know that that's not the way it used to be because the culture's been corrected. And that's kind of the way it used to be, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. It's kind of going to class, doing your homework was optional, and it's not anymore. And, and, and the answer is, you know, there's little old ladies in North Dakota paying for your, subsidizing your, your fees. It costs about $26,000 to have a student there, and we charge 13. Somebody's paying for that. And if you're not, you know, they're not they didn't give us $13,000 for you to not go to class. So if that's gonna be you, you don't have to be here you know, we don't need that number that bad. I would much rather explain why we have 95 students instead of 96 than to try to keep it, the number up by keeping the bar low. Because if you keep the bar low, eventually you're going to have, you're going to lose everything, especially pastors. Yeah, I, in, my, uh, in my doctoral work, one of the classes I, I took that was fascinating, the history of the Lithuanian Lutheran Church. I bet you're wondering why. Okay? Think of the Lithuanian Lutheran Church. Yeah, doing your thing, keeping it real, and then the, uh, then the Bolsheviks come in. And then Hitler comes in. And then Stalin comes in. What's left? Right? And in the midst of that history, uh, they had six candidates for ordination one year, and only two of them were ordained because they wanted to make sure to keep the bar high. So there were four guys they turned away from being a pastor when the primary job of being a pastor was being faithful while you were persecuted. And they didn't think four of them were ready. And so I want to keep the bar high. Because keep the bar high keeps your quality high and it actually helps your quantity in the long run if you can defer your gratification. I'm sorry, I've gone too long. They are from smaller congregations rather than the inner city. Yeah. And me 
me and a lot of us in rural areas think that, oh my, the mega churches are so attractive. Everybody's drawn to them. They really have the programs. That necessarily isn't true. They're falling no. through the cracks. Like you said. Oh, absolutely. No, the, the, the mega church fatigue is. They can hide there. Oh, yeah. It's really. Okay, so that's. We tend to. We tend to catch on to cultural trends in the American Christian church about half a generation late. Okay, the, the mega church thing, it's, it's, it probably serves a purpose. It's not my thing. Okay, um, but that's not what's, what people are being attracted to right now. They're, that's a stereotype. Now, I think casual, you know, yeah, I think I could use a little something religious or ah, I like what they do, that kind of thing. But, but even once you get into, there are good big churches. But what they always try to do is pull you into smaller, more intimate, deep. Okay, but that's what we are right here. You could look at the AFLC as one huge mega church if you want with a bunch of, think, think of the, you, you're, you're a beachhead, not an outpost. Okay, and so think of what you know, God has put here and, and you're, you're able you're, you're even strategically here able to reach the pagans in Kansas so you know, sorry, that was a, okay. um, it's an opportunity these smaller churches that we have are an opportunity and in a small church you can know everybody and engage everybody and build your congregation around who you are and what you have and that that's 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 something that'll work all right, ready. is it time for church yet? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Mm. Well, thank you for your attention.